Hello everyone and welcome to our exclusive expert Q&A on how to give yourself the best chance of passing the FIFA football agent exam. I'm Frederik Broholt, Commercial Vice President of Transroom, and it's fantastic to see so many of our existing trusted agents on this Q&A, but also delighted to welcome many of you who are perhaps newer to Transroom. As football's transfer marketplace, we at Transroom want to bring as much value to agents as possible so you can be set up for success in the exam and in the transfer market afterwards. That's why we are putting on this webinar in collaboration with Lockborough University and Johan Cruyff Institute. It's a crucial time for agents all over the world after a busy summer transfer window. But now attention turns to the FIFA agent exam on September 20th. That is the last chance to pass before the new FIFA regulations fully come into force on October 1st and the exam becomes mandatory for you to operate as a licensed agent. But agents taking the exam have found it challenging. 70% of those sitting the last one in April this year described it as very hard or difficult, and 48% did not pass. Now, why is that? And how can you change that trend and set yourself up for success in September's exam? Well, don't fear, because help is on the way. I am delighted to introduce Dr. Serha Dilmas. Not only has he trained hundreds of agents to pass the exam, but he also passed it this year himself. He is a lecturer in sports law at Lockborough University, where he's also an academic director for agent education, and he runs specialist courses on the FIFA regulations and exam in partnership with Johan Cruyff Institute. He will first give you top tips on the strategy for success and explain the exam format for the first 15 minutes. After that, we'll open the floor to get your questions answered. So please send us any questions you have in the live chat, and we'll do our best to get as many of them answered as possible. Without further ado, please welcome Dr. Serhat Jilmas. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us and Transfer Room. Thanks for the invite and for this session. Uh, as Frederick advised, in the next 15 minutes, I've got some slides for you where I want to give some insight about the exam and also get you think about your exam strategy on the, on the exam day and during the actual exam. And then we are going to open floor for questions where I'll be able to, and I'll try to answer all of your questions. So in terms of the exam itself, what do we know? And I'm sure many of you knows by now, but this is an online exam and you are going to access the exam via FIFA agent platform. Although the exam is administered by your respective national associations. So you will be in a physical space, exam venue organized by your national association, and you will log into the FIFA agent platform. And from there, you will prompt it to the exam section and you will start the exam and complete it. And what also we know that this is an open book exam. And what this means, as you may know, again, FIFA has published the FIFA study materials, which incorporates all of the FIFA regulations as well as safeguarding materials and some of the sporting materials that are relevant for the exam and the exam questions are based on. And during the exam, you will be able to access these materials. Then the exam is based on 20 multiple questions. And what is important to note that these questions are randomly selected by the system so that each candidate sitting the exam gets different set of questions. And you have got 60 minutes to complete these 20 sets of questions. And the success rate or pass rate, sorry, is you need to get minimum 15 questions right or more. As we advise, the next exam date is around the corner on the 20th of September 2023. Now, then what makes this exam challenging? I think for me, the challenge becomes from the fact that actually there's a large volume of FIFA materials that the exam is based on. The FIFA study materials are 693 pages. There are various FIFA regulations from FIFA football agent regulations to FIFA RSTP transfer regulations safeguarding materials so and 
because exam tests your understanding and knowledge on this large volume of, re- of materials, I think this is what makes the exam challenging because it requires your knowledge and understanding of these materials so that you can tackle the questions. And for that, therefore, for me to succeed in the exam, the, there are two strategies. The first one is the study strategy. So I cannot uh, further emphasize the fact that you need to study these materials and try to understand the regulations, try to understand the safeguarding materials. And I don't want to focus on the study strategy because it's you, it's your individual approach to your study and you can follow your own approach, however you are going to study these materials. But I think it's fundamental that you get ready and you study. And then for me, what I want to focus is the exam strategy, which is during the day on the actual exam. And to me, this is two dimension. One is about understanding and the way you can read the exam questions and analyze them. That's I think you can have a strategy there. And then also you need a strategy about navigating the FIFA study materials that you will have access to. And now I want to expand on this, the, the, the exam strategy. So some of the fundamentals, therefore, to start with, what I define as purposeful reading of the exam questions. So what I mean by that is you are reading the question text by tr- trying to identify some clues which will guide you about which regulation or material the question is based on. And even with some questions, you are able to identify which provision the question is testing your knowledge and understanding within specific regulation. Therefore, this is fundamentally important. Focus on reading the question, read purposefully by looking for those clues. And once you fully understand the question, hopefully by then you will be able to answer it based on your knowledge and understanding of the study materials. But as I said, because it's an open book exam, what it means then, if you are struggling identifying the correct answer, then obviously you should consult with the study materials that you will access. So let's now focus on how to analyze the exam questions. And through my experience, I developed actually typology of exam questions. So these are the questions that from the experience of seeing the exam questions in the April 2023 exam, as well as completing the mock mock examination within the FIFA agent platform. So for me, there are four types of questions. The first one I define as direct rule question. So this is a questions where literally asking you specifically on a specific question uh, uh, rule. And through purposefully reading the question, actually you can identify that specific rule, specific provision that the question is based on. The second one is what I define as the scenario-based questions. And these are where you are given some factual scenario, facts, and you need to understand and interpret and then identify the correct answer. Then in terms of the choices, there are questions where you need to have a what I define a single correct choice question. So only one answer is correct. And actually the question text specifies that. I'm just going to show you in a moment. Or there are those questions where actually there are multiple correct answers. So I define them as multiple correct choice questions. And for you to answer those questions, you need to select all of the correct options. So let's look at some of these examples. For instance, this one, by the way, I got these examples from the FIFA mock examinations. So they are not from the real exam. But in the exam, you get similar question sets. And this particular one, as as you can see, I define this as a direct rule question, first of all. Because within the question 
takes. Actually, the question is telling me that this question is about Article 19, Paragraph 2 of the FIFA regulations on the status and transfer of players. So once I identify, I identify this, I know what the question is asking me and based on which regulation and which specific provision. And then as you can see, again, within the question text, the question also tell me select one. So what this means is there is only one correct question for this uh, answer for this specific question. And therefore, you need to select only one correct answer. Now, if you look at another example here, So this second example is what I define as a scenario-based question. And as you can see here, we have got this scenario around Talent FC and their arrangements with another club. And these are some of the most challenging questions from the, from the perspective of the exam because it requires you interpret the information, understand the information, and also, at the same time, you are trying to make sense and understand which regulatory provision covering this scenario and also which particular regulation. So therefore, for me, these are the most challenging ones. And then, as you can see, again, this is a single correct choice uh, question because in the question text, you can see, again, it tells you to select only one correct choice. Now, let's have a look at another example. Okay, in this one, it's a multiple correct choice question. Because as you can see in the question text, it's telling you select one or more. So what this means, therefore, potentially in this question, there are more than one correct choices. And you need to pay particular attention to this type of questions because, as I said, unless you are taking all of the correct options here, you won't be answering this question right. And again, you need to purposefully read these uh, questions as well, the, the text, in order to identify the relevant regulation and provision here. So... This is basically how you can approach reading and analyzing the exam questions by looking for clues, references, keywords, which can guide you about the, the key regulation and key provision that you can then eventually go and navigate through the study materials if you need to, if you can identify the correct answer. Then you need a strategy, obviously, about navigating the study materials. Now, for me, what I would like to advise here, this is going to be your choice, okay? How are you going to access and navigate the study material? But I would like to offer some guidance. What we know, it, during the exam, you can access the study materials through one of the two ways. One is either you can take your hard copy, so literally you print and you take a hard copy of these 693 pages of document, or you will be able to access it through the um, FIFA agent platform as an electronic copy. Now, you need to make a decision whether you want to access this thing as an electronic copy or a hard copy. So, if you decide on the accessing it as a hard copy, there are a number of things to consider. The first one is it's your responsibility to get your hard copy. So you won't be given one by the exam venue by the National Association. So therefore, you need to take your copy. One of the advantages of having hard copy, you can annotate the document. So you can make handwritten notes beforehand and you can take that copy, which has your handwritten notes, into the exam venue. That is allowed. Now, for me, navigation strategy is about that. And what you need to think about is 
how do you navigate 693 pages? So let's say you had a question on FIFA football agent regulations and maybe on Article 15, which is about service fee provisions, then how are you going to, within given time frame, and considering that exam is 60 minutes and you've got a 20 questions, which means that you've got a three average three minutes per question, then you need to think about how would you navigate this hard copy so that you save time in the process. And for me, you can do a number of things, but the key one perhaps to work on is potentially using dividers for each materials, where then you can easily, through those dividers, you can reach into specific regulations or, or, or safeguarding materials, then you can check the relevant provisions. But as I said, it's quite challenging. So therefore, reflect on, on, on this and whether you want to take a hard copy. And if you want to take a hard copy, prepare hard, your hard copy. Make sure that you are practicing navigating the hard copy. Then in terms of electronic copy, as I said, this is permissible and you will access it through the agent platform. When you start the exam, as I have the screen capture there for you, you will have a, a blue link on the exam uh, tab of the uh, platform. And once you click on that uh, uh, tab, it's going to open up the study materials as an electronic copy in a new tab. So it's literally sitting next to the exam tab. So you can just navigate in between. What is important to note is you cannot use your separate electronic copy of the materials. So what I mean by this is where basically you can pull this material uh, before the exam and save it onto your, your computer. So don't do that. So make sure that you are accessing the electronic copy during the exam via link, which will open up in a new browser, and then you are able to navigate that. And obviously, one other challenge with electronic copy is that none of the notes or annotations are permissible on it, because obviously you won't be able to use your electronic version and you will access it during the exam. So you won't have opportunity and it's, it's prohibited anyway. So don't, don't do that. Whereas with hard copy, handwritten notes are permissible. But one of the key advantages of this is that then you can actually search. Key, you can do a keyword search with these electronic versions. Whichever uh, software and laptop you are using, whether it's a Windows, is a, a Mac, you can identify actually search functionality of a document within the tab in an internet browsers, and then basically through keyword search, you can do that. And also, because electronically it's much easier to uh, skip through the, through the pages, I, I think, and, and I use this strategy, so I, I access the materials during the April 2023 exam as an uh, electronic version, and I find it relatively smooth, fast, and, and easier to use than hard copy, which I've seen some candidates then. I saw some candidates actually using the hard copy as well. So uh, this is where I'm going to stop, and we can now take your questions, and we can expand on some of these strategy elements, as well as any specific questions that you might have about the exam. Thank you for your fascinating insights, Sahad. I'm, uh, I'm sure the agents here today will have found that very useful, and hopefully they feel a little less worried now. Um, now, moving on to the questions, I will get the ball rolling while we give the agents in the audience time to add more questions in addition to the ones that have already come in, and, and lots of questions have come in, fortunately. But I'll start us off. Um, as mentioned earlier, the exam is an agent's last chance to get their license, which will be a legal requirement from October 1st. But there are ongoing legal cases in some countries, especially in Germany, which are causing some confusion as to what will happen and what happens when these cases are going on. So what will this mean for agents? And will there still be ways in which agents can operate in certain regions without a license? Okay, excellent question. And yes, we know from the market that there are 
number of challenges going going against these regulations and FIFA. Um, and we know that, for instance, we've got one where, where I am based in England, currently pending uh, against English FA for the adoption of the national regulations. And then we know that there was a case in, in Germany where now there is actually injunction that is going to prevent German FA to actually implement FIFA regulations in, in, in Germany. So all these legal challenges are pending. But as you are for, as you are highlighting, Frederick, that what we know at the moment is, first of all, these legal challenges are pending. So, and we don't know when there will be a decision on these challenges. We know that the one in, in the UK is actually pending, and we are gonna get a decision on that before 30th of September. And then, what impact that? challenge and decision will have on implementation of these new regulations as of 1st of October remains to be seen. Mm -hmm. So therefore, for me, I think if I was an agent, I would really focus on the exam and I try to pass and try to obtain my license without actually waiting for the outcome of these legal challenges. So, because otherwise, as of 1st of October, and imagine this, if you are an, a successful agent and you just rely, you wait for the outcome of these decisions, and then suddenly, as of 1st of October, you operate in certain markets where actually the relevant national association requires you to have a, a license, and then you won't be able to operate. Because don't forget, the, the FIFA license is going to be a global license. So and it will enable the, the agent to operate globally. So therefore, it's, it's not just, you know, oh, because there is a, there's a success in Germany and there is no requirement of license in Germany, then suddenly, you know, an agent will be able to operate there. But it might be that, you know, Spanish FA, Italian FA adopts its own, own regulations based on FIFA regulations, and you won't be able to operate there. So therefore, my advice is we need to wait for the outcome, the outcome of these um, legal challenges, but it shouldn't stop agents taking the exam and attempt to obtain their license. It definitely sounds like uh, the safe option is to try and pass the exam now, even though there is some uncertainty that can, can impact this. Uh, thank you for clarifying that. Uh, moving on to the uh, first question from the audience here. Um, Dino Markan asks, uh, the exam materials have more than 700 pages. Are there a particular section or sections that we should explore more closely, do you think? Um, and the one that possibly covers most of the questions in the exam? Excellent question. So... The key ones, this is from my experience. So what I did is when I took the exam, I analyzed sort of the distribution of my exam questions because I, I defined it as my exam questions because as I said, those questions I got randomly and those that allocated to me, out of 20 questions, majority of my questions, around 65%, 13 of them came from FIFA football agent regulations and FIFA regulations on the status and transfer of players. So FIFA RSTP. So for me, those are the two key regulations that everybody should closely study and fully understand for the purposes of the exam, but as well as for their agent practice for future, because those are the ones also covering the, 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 the profession and the and the transfers, isn't it? So that's why there are large number of questions on those uh, on those two materials. So therefore, those are the key areas. Then I also got two safeguarding questions, and the safeguarding questions, although materials are lengthy, but safeguarding is is in general it's about common understanding of safeguarding. And they were scenario-based where 
the question was asking identifying safeguarding risks and threats in the scenario from agent perspective. And I think any agent with a common understanding of safeguarding can tackle those questions as well. And then the relevant uh, remaining five questions were on different um, uh, regulations of, of FIFA. So for me, therefore, FIFA football agent regulations and FIFA RSTP are the two key materials that must be uh, focus of preparations. That is super useful. Definitely one of the, the top tips of today. So good to pay attention to those ones. Um, the next question is coming both from Bradley and David, uh, who are both asking, can we take both a hard copy as well as use the electronic copy or is it either or? Uh, well, excellent question. There is no, I don't think like this is from me interpreting what's coming from uh, FIFA as a guidance as well as from English FA uh, that perhaps, yes, because they effectively, you know, the, the, for me, the reason I talk about the navigation strategy on the exam uh, materials, study materials, because it requires thinking. But then if you are comfortable and you want to take both, yes, you should be able to because they are permissible materials that can be taken into the exam menu. Therefore, I don't see why not. And then, yeah, maybe a candidate can make a decision as to which one to utilize during the actual exam. But for me, I think if you can strategize beforehand and you are clear as to how you are going to navigate the, the materials, it's better then also you can practice navigating them during the practice examinations that you might you may complete, as well as the mock examination that you must complete, which is available via FIFA Football Agent platform. Super clear. Thank you. Uh, next in line, we have Carsten, who is asking, if you fail the exam, will there be more exams to take in the future? Correct, yes. Um, but basically, what we know from FIFA is until 25-26 period, there will be two exams per year. So after the September exam, we know that there will be one for scheduled for May 2024. And then there will be another one sometimes in November 2024. And then FIFA plans hosting uh, another couple of years, uh, double exams per year. And then eventually we are going to have single exams per year moving forward. So therefore, failing this exam is not end of the world. So those candidates will have, again, chance to reattempt the exam. And the other, other thing to perhaps to advise here that one can attempt the exam as much as they like. Only what FIFA states that basically uh, if, if you fail, obviously, then you need to reapply in the relevant exam period. This is the, the next one is May 2024. And then you need to pay another exam fee, obviously. And therefore, you can retake uh, many times. But obviously, what makes this one challenging is this is the last uh, opportunity mm -hmm. to obtain the license before the FIFA football agent regulations fully come onto force on 1st of October 2023. All clear. Thank you. And we've got uh, Veronique and Pedro both asking about doing the exam in other languages. So a couple of questions here, but, but similar in nature. Uh, but it's essentially around whether uh, the exam is written in English only or if the different FAs will offer the exam in their own languages. So in a case, let's say you are doing the exam in England, but French is perhaps the, the preferred language. Is it possible mm -hmm. to then take the exam in French, but done in England? Or, or what, what is the setup in terms of languages? Yes, good question. So according to FIFA guidance and rules, the exam actually can be taken in three languages. So English, Spanish and French. These are the formal languages of the exam. So once candidate logs into the FIFA agent platform and once then click on the exam tab, which is which, which there will be a link there during the day on the day during the exam period. And then they will be able to select their language, whichever language they are preferring. And out of those three, 
English, Spanish, or French. So then the text will appear in that selected language. So that's one. So uh, therefore, three, three options there, formal options. But what is also important to note on the FIFA agent platform, on the exam section, there is also a tab linked to the unofficial translation. So I also, during my exam, I also play with it. And if you are completing the mock exam on the FIFA agent platform, you can play with the translator link there. Literally, it opens another tab and it gives you almost like Google Translate style platform where actually one copy paste the question and then select the language they want it to be translated. So that tool as well. And I think there are about 30 different languages that the that translation tool has got capacity. So therefore, it's another exam aid available for those, particularly those candidates who are not, um, you know, uh, um, uh, who are not ready for English, French, or, or Spanish version of the exam. Very, very good to know. And um, it sounds like in Veronique's case, uh, you can definitely take the exam in England, but do it in French if, if that is your preferred language. Um, moving on here, uh, we have another question, which is about, um, as national associations administer the exam, what should candidates expect from their respective national associations during the lead up to the exam and on the day itself? Anything specific to, to know in that sense? Excellent question, because what I see in practice is there is a there is a real confusion about this having FIFA exam, but then the role of the national association. Mm -hmm. So let's let's try to explain this. So this is a FIFA FIFA exam. So FIFA coordinates the dates. FIFA coordinates the exam dates. FIFA coordinates the exam questions. But that then the responsibility of the the national association is the administer the exam on the exam date by organizing uh, the venue, first of all. So there will be a venue that you need to expect from the national association to notify you. And at the same time, the, uh, the fee of the exam, because national associations are administering it, making those arrangements, for the venue and, 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 and physical space, therefore also the fee is payable to the national association, the exam fee. For instance, in, the, in, in, in England, it's the, the, the fee is 300 pounds and literally FA writes every approved candidate for the exam with a link and advise them to pay the exam fee on a certain date. So by the way, those uh, joining us from England, the deadline for the exam fees tomorrow, 8th of uh, September 2023. So make sure you check your inboxes for the FA invoice and the invoice link and make sure that you pay the exam fee. And that's one thing. Then once you pay the exam fee, and I can only talk about my experience of the English FA, on lead up to the April 2023 exam, I got number of correspondences from, F, from the FA about the arrangements. So this was basically where they advised us that they are working on the venue, then we were notified about the venue, then we were notified about some of the key rules on the day, what we can do and what we cannot do in the venue and during the exam. So therefore, again, constantly check your inboxes and make sure you are tracking those email communications from your respective national FAs. Then during the exam on the day, obviously you turn up on the venue with your ID that you use to create your uh, FIFA agent platform account. And that's where FA will verify, the representative of FA verifies your identity and check your records on the FIFA agent platform as an approved exam candidate. And where those um, information matches, then you are allowed to access into the exam venue. And again, there 
you will be given a specific seat, you will have a number, you will sit down, you will have your laptop, and then they help you with any connectivity issues, any support that you might need on the day as well. So actually, national associations, therefore, they do quite a lot with respect to the administration of the exam and during the period leading up to the exam. Excellent. Uh, it definitely sounds like in the case that you experienced with the English FA that it was quite clear, but uh, but a good encouragement to everyone here to keep their eyes on the inbox, especially from mm -hmm. tomorrow, September 8th, mm -hmm. and then obviously caveating that there might be a bit of discrepancies between what you've experienced and then what others Correct. in other countries might experience. Um, very clear. We have uh, Josef Martinez asking, um, are there any regulations that are specific to the country you're working in that they try to trick you with? Or do all the regulations to apply to all countries? No, so there is no there is no such thing. So whatever is on the FIFA study materials, and that's basically based on FIFA materials, so FIFA regulations and FIFA safeguarding documents. So therefore, there is no um, there is no such approach that because certain nations are distinct, therefore there are different questions or nuances. So. Um, uh, well, at least, again, this is from my experience, but FIFA also has been clear in their communications when they launch the exam and the, 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 the Q&A that they run on the new regulations, they were on new FIFA football agent regulations, they were very clear that this is a FIFA exam and it's based on FIFA, FIFA study materials. So therefore, candidates shouldn't really worry about the national regulations which might be uh, different than the the fifa regulations but the exam is about those materials within the fifa study materials great to hear that there's no uh, obvious reason for concern there it should be uh, following the fifa fifa guidelines overall um, we've had a few agents asking about the different types of questions you might see on the exam um, mm -hmm. based on the four types of questions that you shared in your presentation before. Mm -hmm. So as an example, Michael asked, Hello, Dr. Zaha, do you recall how many scenario-based questions existed on the April exam? And others like Ramtin asked, out of those four types of exam questions you mentioned, which one did you encounter the most? So to boil it down, is there any advice you can give on the likely split of the different types of questions? Okay, good, good question. And I can only, as I said, talk from my experience. And for me, um, now on the top of my head, I'm trying to recall, but I had six to seven scenario based questions. Okay, so that was sort of, I remember like re reading those and trying to make sense of it. As I said, safeguarding questions were definitely scenario based. It was based on like player experience of club where there were safeguarding hazards with respect to the players training, playing football. Then the question was asking identifying those risks. And that's uh, those safeguarding questions were, uh, as far as I recall, they were multiple choice. So also like they, it requires selecting more than one, one correct choices. Um, the other thing I, I, I recall, so that's really with respect to scenario base uh, versus direct rule questions. The other thing like I can advise, like I had four questions on uh, service fee provision of the foot, FIFA football agent regulations. And two of them were scenario based. So there was a scenario with figures and asking me, the, the level of fees that uh, service fee that agent can receive. And then two were sort of direct about the percentages. So for me, I think it's quite critical that every candidate understand the, the service fee provisions well. And then with me, I also had four questions on training uh, uh, compensation regime. I had three on the training compensation and one on the solidarity. So those were also sort of like stuck with me as a two core areas. But as I said, all that I'm saying this, because questions are randomly selected, this is what I had. So I'm not, I'm not um, basically, uh, you know, preaching here that I think those are important areas, but you might just not get as many questions as uh, like I had on those specific areas. No. And I hope you... this is helpful. Yeah. 
Now, it, it sounds like you, you definitely can't know for sure, but in, in your case, approximately one third were, were scenario based. So maybe that is a bit of guidance, but as Sahat said, um, it's randomly selected. So it, it could definitely be different. Um, Roof is, uh, is asking, will calculating the solidarity mechanism be part of the exam? So as there are hardly any examples of this, especially for transfers within UEFA. Uh, yes. Uh, well, as, as it is the part of the uh, part of the regulations, part of the RSTP, and within RSTP, as you may know, Ruth, so there is a there is a specific article regulating the solidarity contributions. Then you have got the annex, isn't it? Uh, and within that annex, actually, there is a prescription of like what would be the percentage of the solidarity contribution from the mm -hmm. transfer fee and then how it's going to be distributed. So I think the formula is there. OK, so this is important to note. And therefore, it opens a scope for the application of the formula in a question. Did I get that in my exam? No. Mine was more about straight about application of the solidarity contributions in a specific specific transfer but it didn't involve calculation it didn't involve the figures okay, okay. but we cannot dismiss the possibility that you might get a question where you need to calculate the solidarity contribution that is clear um, and while on the topic of math and calculations on a more practical level um bradley is asking if you can take a calculator into the exam uh, I would I would advise to check the exam rules again. Uh, I skimmed through it, but uh, uh, just uh, forgetting it now. As far as I recall, it's permissible. Check the permissible items for the exam under the exam rules, which we shared the the uh, the the link to the exam rules on on the chat. So, uh, as far as I recall, it is permissible. Yes. Okay. There are a lot of questions that have also come in around the practice exam versus the actual exam. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm going to just share a few examples at once, and then perhaps you can maybe try and give a summary as some of the questions are asking relatively similar things. So as one example, Carsten is saying, I heard from others that the practice exam is much easier than the actual exam. Milos is asking, are the questions on the current exam practice on the FIFA agent platform, similar style and toughness, or what can you expect versus that? And along the same lines, Oman is, um, is asking, I've now passed the practice exam 20 times in a row. How ready and confident should I feel to pass the original exam? So essentially, how, how much of a difference should be expected between those two? Excellent questions. So the the last last uh, uh, participant from audience that you make reference to who passed the twenty times, can you just ask if they got in their each attempt they got new set of questions? Can you please check that for me, Frederick? As a, as a question, if they can comment on that because it's a yeah. it's an interesting one to 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 note really, but. Uh, so some of the questions I covered, and most of the questions, sorry, those, those three examples I covered on my uh, presentation is actually from my mock exam. And I must say that I got, in terms of the formation of the questions, you get similar type. As I said, that, that's clear. So therefore, when you are purposefully reading the questions and what to look for, just practice that when you are completing the mock exam. So try to like think strategically about, you know, oh, is there a regulation actually being spelled out in this in this uh, question text? Okay, is it select one or select one or more question? Yeah, those, so those, th those things, the mock exam and the, the, the exam of the, the real exams are the same, okay? And then... Uh, in terms of difficulty, um, I would say I also I, I felt the r real exam questions were harder than the mock exam. But that's again, that's my impression. And when I took the April exam, I actually attempted the mock exam once. And the reason I am asking whether you get different set of questions each time you attempt, because 
I've been advised by some other, other candidates that sitting into the this September exam, actually you can now attempt the mock exam number of times and each time you get different set of questions. So I'm just trying to establish whether it's the case. We, for your information, we, we have asked the Uman back who asked the question, and I'll I'll let you know and come back to it if okay. um, if he responds. But it sounds like uh, there could be differences. If I mm-hmm. think back on when you had to take a driver's license many years ago, that was the same feeling I had. So maybe there is something about um, the mock-ups being different than the actual ones. Um, Caleb here is asking, did you yourself see questions from the mock exam in the main exam or not? No, I did not. No. And I, I, I think my, my understanding is I think the, uh, the, there is a pool of questions for the mock exam that sits in the system. Then, and this is, this is my sort of interpretation of the, the guidance from FIFA. And there is a pool of questions for the real exam that they designed. So, but with my experience, no, I didn't have any, any like identical questions, I would say. No. Okay. It sounds like it, it, it would be from different pools of questions. Um, we've got another question here from Sam. Um, Sahad, you said you have to use the PDF on the platform. I got told from other agents that they didn't check this and we would be able to use the one on our desktop, which is easier to navigate. What was your experience on this? Okay. What? Again, this is a good question and we need to bring some clarity there. So what I am suggesting, do not have a saved copy on your desktop. Because if you look at the exam rules, Article 8, it's actually specifically defined that those those type of materials are not permissible. But what I am advising on the day when you are during the exam, click on the study materials tab uh, link, which is going to open a new tab, but as a browser within your browser, then download it as a PDF. Okay? Without saving it, then work with it. That's, that's, that should be permissible because what you are doing, basically, you are getting the the, the, the PDF file during the actual exam via link provided by FIFA. But my interpretation of that Article 18 within the FIFA agent exam rules around uh, permissible materials and uh, 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 exam conduct particularly, that is, that those type of files, they are not permitted. So just be careful with that. And again, from my experience, what I can say, in the venue in April exam, FA had, had their own invigilators and they go around uh, and because, you know, I didn't engage and I don't think I have, I, we haven't experienced any problem, by the way, on the venue during that day. But all I am saying is there are someone who are monitoring the venue, monitoring the candidates, therefore to be on the safe side, I wouldn't have a pre-saved PDF file. I would access the materials via agent platform and then download it as a PDF if you want to work with the PDF. That is clear. Thank you for clarifying that. Um, another question from uh, from James in the audience, which goes, if you or someone is not legally ch- trained, How best can they use their time over the next two weeks to prepare? Is the exam more about application of the regulations than memorization or a combination of that? Well, really good question because the the time is is essence now, isn't it? And for me, um, where where to start with that? So I'm always mindful of the fact that I think, you know, I've been seeing on social media about, you know, tricks around the exam and some of the messages more around like using the materials and uh, doing, you know, through keyword search and, and being strategic with the materials in order to answer the questions. But I think 
there's a challenge there. For me, I think you need to study. So my advice would be study as much as you can. Because the key thing is, when you, during the exam, if you are not, you know, familiar with the material, you, if you are not familiar with the provisions, particularly on the scenario-based questions, basically you are interpreting an inter information and then the question naturally asking you to apply the scenario to the regulations or apply regulations to the scenario. And it can be challenging. Like in my, in my exam, my first question was a service fee provision question and I spent about 10 minutes on it. I was trying to make, and I'm, yeah, I was shocked. And I'm like, this is true story. And I was trying to understand the question, interpret it, and then try to apply the service fee provisions. And then I had those questions. They were, you know, direct rule and much, I was, you know, able to answer those questions much quickly. But for me, I think without studying, just purely thinking about, because you have access to the study materials and then, you know, you can really pass this exam by just, um, you know, engaging with the study materials. I think that's a big risk. So therefore, study, study, study. That's, that's a key advice. And then perhaps because of time's essence now, obviously you need to use time, your preparation time strategically Perhaps make sure you are understanding FIFA football agent regulations and FIFA RSTP so that you are giving your chance answering majority of the questions. Then uh, expect to work with the remaining questions uh, even if you don't have time to, to, to cover all of the materials so that you can work with the study materials during the exam but please 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 don't purely rely on study materials because they are available to you and think that you are able you would be able to answer every questions by just consulting the materials it's going to be very challenging it is clear there are as you said 20 questions and only 60 minutes so uh, you have to prepare uh, the three words you mentioned there have definitely stuck so um, everyone please remember study 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 we um, we have a bit over five minutes left um, so please keep coming with questions we do have to wrap up relatively soon but if there's any burning questions you have please uh, please keep them coming um, we have another one from matthias who's asking do you know right away if you pass the exam or not no uh, again with my experience it takes a bit of time just to let you know so you are notified on the FIFA agent platform again. So right now, basically those approved candidates, probably what they are seeing on their uh, status on the uh, FIFA agent platform is ready to take the exam. So you are ready to go. As soon as you take the exam, that status will turn into exam taking and results are pending. And eventually you will have a status changes into exam passed. And that's where... and. On the top of my head, I'm trying to recall, but I think it took about two weeks to get the result. It was after, because exam was on the 19th of April. Yeah, I think it was sometimes in early May that we get the results. And just to note, you don't get your, your, uh, your grade. All you are gonna get is pass or fail. Obviously those, because I didn't fail, those failed ones, they can, uh, I'm not sure if they can review the, their results, but the, 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 those that pass the exam, you can't even review your, your, your results. Okay. Well, it sounds like in this particular case, given the exam date is on the 20s, that you might actually only find out Correct. after the Correct. new rules have come into effect on October 1st. Okay. Um, or, a couple or, of... or sorry, Frederick, just adding, probably this one would be sooner because obviously by 1st of October, those who pass the exam, they need to be licensed, isn't it? So... Uh, John has asked us here, uh, more than half of agents uh, failed the first exam back in March, or 48% to be exact. Uh, why do you think that was? 
Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's an interesting one, and um, I yeah, I suppose they weren't ready. <laughs> it's a, as I said, it's a, it's a challenging exam, but also what is important to note is that actually half of the half of the candidates registered for the exam actually they didn't take it. This is the other side of the coin. I think right now we know. Uh, about uh, just over 10,000, for instance, registered for this exam, so ready to take the exam, but we don't know actually how many are going to take it on the day. So whether therefore that success and, and failure rate of, you know, 52 to 48% reflects the real, real uh, uh, numbers. So if those who didn't take it would take it, then, then of then, you know, the, the, their grades and their uh, performance incorporated onto those um, those analytics. I think we can see a different picture. But uh, the only thing I can think of is uh, it's a challenging exam, and yeah, uh, probably they weren't ready. Seems like a reasonable explanation. Um, unfortunately, we are nearly out of time, so I'll just ask uh, one final question um, to the audience and everyone who joined us here. Sorry if we haven't got around to answering a question that you submitted. We've received a lot during the session, um, which is obviously great, uh, but we are constrained by time. Uh, Jack has just mentioned in the chat that if you leave any further comments in the Q&A, we'll do our best to get back to you offline with an answer. Um, but the last question uh, coming here is, as we mentioned briefly at the start of the session, you run specialist courses on the exam for agents. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a bit more about the courses and where they can find out more if they're interested? Yeah, so basically, um, um, we have been actually running, I'm director of sports agent education here at Loughborough University, and we have been running bespoke executive education for sports agents, particularly for football agents since October 2018. And the Kite, Kite Mark one is the professional certificate program for sports agents. And this is where we try to uh, through education, we try to professionalize agents, and um, uh, and this is an education endorsed by the industry. And now we are offering this in collaboration with Johann Cruyff Institute, and uh, it's it has got a it's an online program, but it's also involving live online sessions. Now, alongside that, as the FIFA introduced the exam. We launch also our training course on the FIFA Football Agent Examination. And this is a course specifically designed for the exam preparations. And within this course, you are able to uh, uh, systematically study the FIFA study materials. So each regulation and safeguarding materials. And then we have got also a module on exam strategy. And then we have got also practice examinations where we try to replicate through our uh, e-learning authoring tool, we try to replicate actually real exam experience through designing similar questions, but also the similar functionality as the FIFA football agent platform. So this course now has been, uh, we have got a... a Delegates studying it currently globally from all over the world, agents and trying to get ready for the September uh, 20 exam, and um, and therefore it's 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 one of the key one uh, that we are offering just to help agents to get ready for the exam and pass it. Well, it definitely sounds like uh, that that would be of incredible that value and a lot of help if, um, uh, for those who are taking the exam. So thank you for sharing that. Uh, that is unfortunately all the time, uh, all that we've got time for in, um, in this round. Um, thanks to you, all the agents for joining us and for all your great questions, but also a big thank you to Dr. Sayaha Dilmas for his uh, expertise and for sharing all the um, fantastic and very useful advice. We will be posting the full Q&A on YouTube. So if you subscribe to our channel at Transroom, uh, you can watch it back again and make sure you don't miss any of the insights that, that Serhat has, uh, has shared today. There is still time to enroll in Loughborough University and Johan Cruyff Institute's training course on the FIFA agent exam and regulations. So you can learn the new regulations inside out and master the exam as, uh, as Serhat just explained. 
If you are interested in that, please visit sportagentprogram.com to, to find out more. If you want to accelerate your success in the transfer market, become a verified agent and open up deal opportunities in over 100 leagues around the world, visit transroom.com to find out how to join our network of over 350 trusted agents on Transroom today. We uh, wish you success in the FIFA exam on September 20th. Thank you and see you again soon.